welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness um, about technology, energy, globalism, and diversification. As part of the Think Tech series, today's show is the Arts in Hawaii. I'm Donna Blanchard, your host, managing director of Kumukuhue Theater, and joining me is artist Ed Faruke. I'm very happy to have you here. Thank you uh, for having me. Well, uh, absolutely. Today we're going to talk about fine art in Hawaii. Uh, remember that we broadcast on the internet at 2 o'clock at 4 o'clock every day. Our shows are streamed on Ustream.tv and Spreaker.com. And if you want links to any of our shows and as well as um, uh, upcoming and archive information, go to ThinkTechHawaii.com. If you wish to join us in our downtown studio, uh, just write to J at ThinkTechHawaii.com. Ed Friuke has created more than 4,000 pieces. Uh, the, images, the image of one of his paintings graces the cover of the Hawaiian History Reference Book, A History of Hawaii, which is used by Hawaii's public and private schools. And two of his paintings were featured on an episode of the television series Lost, one of my favorites. <laughs> and I don't know if that sounds like, that doesn't tell this much of the story about you, but I like that show, so I decided oh. to throw that in there. I'm really glad that you came down. I met one of your paintings before I met you, and I have that painting hanging in my home. I look at it every day. I absolutely love it. I am fascinated by the, um, the texture in your work, the use of color and light. The, the light that you bring into the piece looks like um, smoke and mirrors. It looks like there has to be a, a, a source of light hidden someplace to me. Um, and I think that's very interesting. So I'm happy to have you so we can all learn a little bit more about you. First of all, I'd like to start with that number, over 4,000 pieces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was logging each one after I hit 4,000 then I stopped counting and I, and that, that's been about 10 years ago and that's been so we could be closer to 4,500 by now and so. maybe yeah maybe even more maybe do you paint every day uh, mostly every day um, I teach three classes so I paint those days and sometimes I try to go out on plein air and do some painting, or sometimes I'll paint at my home, in, uh, in my studio in my home. Go, uh, go out in plain air, did you say? Plain air, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. means to go on location oh. and, and paint. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, you know, uh, people need to go out at least once. If, you, if, you're, if you're a studio painter, then you need to get out there and to experience the, the air, the sun, the ground, and you really can bring that energy that you get into your work. And that is the key to what I tell my students. I said, you need to go out at least a couple of times to just get the energy and to, so that you can, you, you are convinced you know what you're doing and painting. Because you cannot paint something that you are not sure of, that you don't know. So let me get this straight, because this may be the secret behind the light that I'm seeing in the painting that I have. If, if you had a really wonderful high-resolution photograph of a landscape and you painted, looking at that, you chose that landscape to paint and you painted it, versus actually going in to that landscape and painting the exact same view, mm -hmm. you would end up with two different paintings. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> People have s said that they can tell when I've gone out and painted, and when I painted in the studio. This was in my early, early days. Now I don't think it's that much, but um, I can see some difference in colors, in, in the values, in, in the feel, in the feeling of the paintings that I do outside, compared to the ones that I do inside. Uh, so, but when you're painting, do you feel that you are making choices when you are painting, or are you moved? I think both. I think you you move first, and then and then you look at your colors. You know what colors you choose. I mean, if you paint from a calendar, 
then exactly like what you see on, on the calendar, then your painting will look exactly like the calendar. So you need to have that experience of looking at something, a photo, and bringing your, your energy, your energy into the painting, which changes the color. So it's not the same. It's the composition might be the same, but the colors would be different. Um, I've, I've had students when they're painting from the calendar, or photograph looks exactly like the photograph, the colors and, and no, no feeling. And that's the same thing, I think with anything, with portraits too. You can have really good artists, somebody that's technically, um, you know, perfect and knows what they're doing, but, and somebody that's, that's not so much, but it's the energy that you give, put in the piece. So I've seen really beautifully done paintings, but no life, no, no life to the piece. And then you have others that are kind of messy, and, but it's exciting, it, it, there's energy, it, there is energy. Is that why the Mona Lisa is so popular? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think people made it more popular. <laughs> Someone made the decision that that should be popular. Right? Yeah. So if you paint and you're in a bad mood, does that, that affect the work or does the work affect the mood? You know, I've been asked that many times and um, uh, it can work both ways. There are some times when you know, I'm really excited and really, I really want to do this painting and then I'll start painting and then either through over, um, over excitement of doing it, painting it, then it, I start getting frustrated because it's not coming out how I uh, see it. And I can be, sometimes I'm in a not sad mood or something and then I'll start painting and then if I'll get into it and then it, I will lose myself, and then eventually, you know, you it lifts me up. Mm -hmm. So it it depends. I think. Yeah. You can never tell. Even when I start a canvas, I'm nervous. When I start a canvas, I don't know how it's going to come out, and I, I'm afraid that it won't come out. So, and I tell my people that I say, don't be afraid, no fear. So that's what we say, no fear, just do it. Just do it not knowing what your focus is going to be necessarily on a piece. Uh, yeah, you have to have some focus, but when you are, after you got that, uh, you know, um, decided, then you just, no fear in just painting, use the colors, use, use the colors, bright colors if you want, if you feel it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I've had people say, oh, you know, because I have a sense of color that I can sense the color, but um, to some extent that's true, I think. But so I tell them, but you, once you get some confidence in your in your color choices and your your feeling, your emotions, then it'll work out. Because to me, I think a lot of it is energy. Uh, there's a book by a woman named Lynn McTaggart called The Field, and she talked about how, it's a very non-artistic book, but she talks about how when we see, we're driving down the road and we see a blue pickup, we are not really seeing that blue pickup. Our mind registers blue pickup, and then a, an amalgamation of every blue pickup we've ever seen is actually... Um, uh, transposed onto the image of that pickup we're driving by. In other words, we don't really see a lot of what's going on around us mm -hmm. because our brain says, blue pickup, okay, done, without mm -hmm. looking at the detail. Okay. I think that you probably see the, the blue pickup that's in front of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't think you could create your work if you were not seeing the detail in everyday life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can recognize the detail, but, but when you paint it, then not, you filter it all out. You filter it also. I mean, you, you know, people want to put everything in, all the details in some paintings, and um, then I tell them you, you're telling too much story, too, talking story too much. Too much story here, too much story there. You know, it's like parts of their work. Yeah, um, 
you look at the overall and then and, and you see the main focus and that's the thing and not to tell the story here tell the story there in, in, in each section of your way your work you want to tell one story because then people will get so it's bogged down in the details. Yeah, yeah well that's why our brains categorize you know so we can move on to the next thought if we were aware of yes. everything going on all the yeah. time it would be overload yeah. for us it would yeah. be exhausting yeah. to say the least yeah. but i never imagined i would hear uh, I never imagined that you would say something like that and not <laughs> worry <too>. about the <laughs> details. Because yeah. I think that your work has so much detail, detail. in it. It's all in the my imagination of the viewer. It's the, um, you know, the colors are just fragmented. And, and so each viewer can see something different or each viewer can look and just the imagination goes to work. It's more like impressionistic. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, okay, that's interesting. Some of your work is, uh, you spend some time on the mainland. And, yes. and we'll get, I want to go back to when you first started painting here pretty soon. But um, I, some of your work was done on the mainland, and I see those pieces, and they immediately bring an emotional response for me. Because yeah. I grew up on the mainland, and a lot of those, a lot of the scenery, I, I smell, I swear, I can mm -hmm. smell. Um, and the pieces that are uh, uh, Hawaiian landscapes are beautiful and they are very familiar to me now, but I don't have childhood memories here, right, certainly. Right. So, okay, yeah, that's interesting. That makes me want to go back and, and um, uh, I think in the, in the next segment we'll actually look at some of the pieces that we have and, and, and talk about the to talk about the inspiration that brought okay. you to those pieces. Do you normally, do you have some, any sort of spiritual practice that you use in conjunction with a painting? Do you generally like to meditate before? No, um, but I do meditate. I, I do meditate. Um, I try to every day. I um, do several um, processes of meditations. Um, I've uh, studied Reiki, I've studied um, the Ho'oponopono, I've studied, um, I'm currently I go to Ho'oponopono and the, um, um, the mindful uh, community and meditation group in, in the Pali Highway. Um, so I do several of, of these um, and I don't know, I just pick one that I feel most comfortable with that I do once a day. And currently, Oprah has a 21-day meditation course. So it's a 10th day, so, I'm, so uh, my friend and I are doing it. Um, oh, it's cool. beautiful, it's, it's really beautiful, relaxing every morning. Yeah. I, did, I did the last one that, yeah. that she ran, right. and that was, it's pretty magnificent to do, we're gonna give Oprah a little plug here. <laughs> yeah. She needs us to do that for her. Um, when you know that several m millions of people are, yeah. are doing this with you. I mean, that she's reaching millions. I don't know about several millions, but oh, yeah. um, she, or a lot of people are spending mindful time yeah. being uh, uh, in the moment, mm -hmm. at that moment with you. That's yeah. pretty miraculous energy. Well, and I find that the generation, younger generation, the group, the mindfulness group that I go to, um, is they fashion the, their follow the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and I've, I've noticed an uh, influx, influx of young people, the younger generation coming in are curious, and which is good because, you know, he's just teaching pre, uh, peace. He, he just wants peace like everybody else, you know. And, um, and it's good to see the young, younger kids come in and curious and you know, and because that's the future of our of our oh, world. Yeah. So, yeah. there's so much soul in your work. I this is not normally a conversation. I think that people would expect to come from a just conversation with a painter. We, we're eventually <laughs> going to talk about how you hold a palette knife and all of that. But um, I think the soul in your work uh, shows the soulfulness of it, and it's the definition of a fine art that we. 
it is something that we live with, and it's part of us. It's my definition of it, anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like, particularly in my position with the theater, I spend probably more than 50% of my working time justifying the import of what we do and why you should support us and why you should be there and why you should tell your friends about what we do because this art is important in our lives. And um, I think that when it comes to painting, it's more, it's more accepted that that aesthetic uh, hanging in our homes is uh, just a part of our, our mood. Mm -hmm. It becomes a part of our spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really admire that. I, I like the way you live. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and what you bring to your art. What, when did mm. you start painting? Oh, in 1975, I started painting. Um, a friend introduced me my sketches I had done in high school. Uh, I've never taken any art classes to anyway he, he showed it to Tagami, Hiroshi Tagami uh, and um, Tagami said you should paint so I give Hiroshi Tagami a lot of credit whenever I see him I'm always thanking him um, I think he's in his 80s now I think but um, uh, yeah he if it wasn't for him I wouldn't have been on this journey I'm on now I want to thank him too <laughs> we're, we're going to go to a break real quick. This is the Arts in Hawaii on uh, thinktechhawaii.com. I'm Donna Blanchard, and I am talking with Ed Fadaruke, and we'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. I want to tell you about our program this month. We're doing a lunch and panel program at the Plaza Club with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech about China. It's don't be afraid to send your kid or CEO to China stories of daring do and of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness in the People's Republic. We want to introduce you to some people who have lived in China and show you that life in China is not so bad. It's not all about corruption and environmental degradation and lack of civil or human rights. It's not like that. And we want to have them tell you their day-to-day -day stories about how they've lived there. So our moderator is Larry Foster. He has taught uh, law in China and he has been practicing law in China for a firm in, uh, in Shanghai. His wife, Brenda Foster, is on the panel. Uh, she has been the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. We have Russell Liu. He's an attorney practicing with Shepard Mullen uh, in Beijing for quite some time. Shackley Ruffetto, a circuit court judge from Maui, who, uh, after retiring, went to China so he could teach judicial process there. And uh, Nikki Shishido, who has worked for DBED, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism of the State of Hawaii uh, in Beijing for some time. All these people have had the experience of living on the ground in China. We want to have them tell their stories to you. So maybe this will encourage you to send your kid or CEO to China. So if you're interested in this program, which ought to be very interesting, come down on August 22nd. You can sign up at hvca.org. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. We'll see you there. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. This is the Arts in Hawaii at uh, Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm talking with Ed Furouke, who I, I was corrected, I was pronouncing his name wrong, and I am I'm deeply sorry that I was doing that. It's okay. Uh, and we have props. Well, <laughs> yeah, we have <laughs> props. Decided. Let's, um, uh, you started painting in 1975. You, you had a draw, just a drawing. That you Drawings that I used to do, and um, you know, when I was in my teen years, and Tagami said I should think about painting. The funny thing is that when I've never told him this, is that I never liked his work when I saw his <laughs> work. <laughs> well, this was he, when he knows now. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, sorry Tagami, but I love it now. But um, at that time, you know, I was very young and. Um, I was not, I did not look at paintings at all. I never even thought I would ever be painting. And so I thought painting was really with the brush and really detail and real meticulous. You know, I thought that's a beautiful painting and it still is. But uh, at that time when I saw his with the knife and it was just all which way and you go up and it's just, you know, jumble of colors and paint and, you know, I, I said, oh, no, I don't think so. But then, you know, 
he said he'd give me lessons, so go over his house and we'd do sketches, and then I would go out and uh, on on the, on the site and paint with him. And it took me about a year, I think. And I remember when, for me, it something like no matter how much I I talk to the, my students and things, then I tell them there's going to come a time, a point where something's going to click in your mind, and then you understand what I'm trying to, what you, what I mean when I'm talking, because I'm telling you all these things and and you're doing it, but it's it's something and that's what happened to me with Tagami was he he'd tell me stuff and oh no no and then one day I got really frustrated at the beach on Makapu'u and I just sat down and I said oh, I'm so I'm so angry so he came over and he said you just do this you just do that and I was watching then I went back I started to paint and I struggled but then all of a sudden something happened and it just wow okay after that, then I would paint, and it would be e get easier to paint and to understand what he was saying. And I don't, I cannot under, ex explain this. Um, so, uh, yeah, and if it took years for you to get there, we're not going to be able to get it here. But you're, you're talking about to, to understand the depth, I mean, how to put depth and light and yeah, reality or, or, onto a camera. Or even the, the thought before that is to connect that thought of what I'm saying with the thought of actually painting before even the rules and all that. There's something that I think is just click, happens. Oh, well, I, I think that. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want that. So I teach my students on now how I learned. And it's not through, you know, all this other stuff, you know, all the, um, I'm, learning to draw as I paint but you know be, and what I tell them too but if you learn how to draw first it's much easier to paint but I just jumped in there and I just was painting so you don't put anything on the canvas before paint uh, I do a rough sketch with charcoal but I mean okay. drawing by I mean that I'm um, learning to draw first you know I didn't go to school and all that Right into paint yeah. and right into use of the palette knife. Yeah, right, right with yeah, not with brush or anything. So yeah. that's interesting. Can you can you show us a little bit? You you brought this wonderful prop. You have actual <laughs> paint, wet paint. There's wet paint on here. Yeah, there's wet paint. Yeah, I um, well, I, I need my glasses first. Like I'll. Pick up this color, uh, white, or if I'm going to be doing the water, then I'll get some thalo blue, or thalo green and thalo blue, and violet and some white, and I'll get some burnt sienna, and I'll just mix it, mix it just like that, and I tell them don't over mix because you mix the energy out of your work, and you just paint, and you just paint it. And go out to that. You start with the dark, and then if you wanna. Well, I'm gonna show this in just a minute. I'll hold it up. Oh, yeah. And then if you wanna do the wave, yeah. The depth in it. Yeah. So this part where you're mixing up here, this is not on the canvas. This is just what happens on the board. When you originally started doing that, I wasn't yeah. sure where you were going. Yeah, yeah. This is the mixing, and then this I would be putting it on the canvas, and as I'm painting it. Yeah. Can I turn this? Yeah. Okay. Just so uh, we can't actually get a close-up of it here, but if we can just see yeah, the so depth that's coming out with the use of the. Yeah, so I use the dark. I'm painting upside down, but... <laughs> <laughs> you do pretty good. Yeah. So far, so good. 
I can't even tell the difference in some of those colors. In some of those yeah, colors. after a while, then you get used to. You know, usually I have something to clean my knife, but I don't have any. I didn't bring any. I hear old phone books work very well. Yeah. Pages of old yeah. phone books. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's see. I can see the. Yeah, then I'll just put the. Depth coming out in there. Yeah. So if this is going to be a wave. Okay, then. It's so inexact. Yeah, I mean, you get a broader area and then, you know. You know. But more like reality. Thank you yeah, very much yeah. for doing that. Um, and we have, we have an, example, an example of your work here that is um, a vineyard. Yeah, it's a vineyard. I did this in, um, in Napa, uh, maybe about maybe three months ago. And I went out there, and I have some good friends that live in Napa, and we stayed at their ho ho home. And then we, um, the husband, Alan, likes to paint. He's really enthusiastic. So every time I go, and then we get out there painting two, three times every, every time I go. And he just he comes here too a lot. He goes to the corner and then, and then we fly over and stay with him and then we, uh, and then we go painting um, in corner when he's here. So he's coming out next week actually. So uh, all of the detail in here happened with a palette knife like this. Yeah, yeah, all, all this. Well, you sure save a lot of money on brushes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. That's what a lot of brush painters come when into the class. They say, oh man, there's no, not that many brushes and turp and all that stuff, yeah. Turp? Turp, oh, to clean the knife. Uh, they, they use something else now, I, I don't know what they call it. To clean the knife, and I'm not the knife, but the brushes they, to clean. And I use, uh, you know, the wet ones, those wipe, wipe, oh, yeah, okay. and to clean the, um, my hands and all with the wet ones. You know, the one they use for babies. Is that clean? Pretty good, yeah. Baby butt wipes? Yeah, I baby butt wipes. Yeah. Oh, you can see on the monitor, we've got a close up of the piece now. Thank you very much, Jim. Oh, okay. Uh, so we can see uh, there's so, so much detail in there. I imagine that painting being done with. Uh, oh, there we go. With a, 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 a paintbrush the size of a toothpick and painstaking hours and. How long, how much time have you spent on that piece? This piece, uh, we went out there, we stayed for a couple of hours. Um, then I went, came back. Uh, actually, I brought it back to Hawaii and then I finished it up. I added, I popped some colors and yeah. Um, yeah, yeah the, I, I try to get the name of the winery, but I, I, I was unable to. Uh -huh. Yeah, but. Um, it's so it's a vineyard in the either fall or very early spring, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Er, early spring. Early yeah, you can see the the season in there. Yeah. What? Uh, <coughs> you, you so you started painting in 1975, and did you um, immediately feel emotion in the work? Did you immediately? Feel that spirituality in it? Um, in my very first oh, pieces? Yeah, when you started. Um, is that something that grew? That something no, that I didn't. You know, I have to turn my better turn my phone off. Is that your phone? No, that's Jay's phone. But oh. I need before. <laughs> but it reminded him to turn yes, his off. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Because I forgot to <laughs> say anything, and yours is right by your microphone. Yeah, <laughs> so. uh, that would be entertaining. <laughs> Putting in Rinto. Uh, you, what kind of subject matter did you use you, when you started? You were going outside and painting. We were going outside, so we'd go to Makapu'u. And actually, I say I uh, cut my teeth on the Ko'ala Mountains. I used to go twice a day. I was working, and I would start early in the morning couple of hours, come back, take a shower, get ready, go to work, then come back, rush back home. Uh, at that time of 3.30, rush back home, go out and paint, because I lived on the windward side. And, and because I loved it, I, I really loved it. And all Ko'olaus, I would be painting Ko'olaus all the time. 
And then um, eventually I asked my boss if I could work part-time because I was on the zoo fence and I was selling my work there every Saturday, Sunday. This is the fence at the zoo, the zoo. Down, out, down on Montserrat. Mo yeah, on Montserrat. That's where a lot of artists get their start. Tagami was there for many years, uh, David Lee. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if Peter Herod, I think Peter Herod was there for a little bit because he, he came and he taught a bunch of local artists. Peter's from New York. And um, their paintings changed, like Pilsun Conklin, her paintings hang in straw, beautiful work. Um, and it, it changed as a result of, and, I'm sorry, and the I'm colors. Changed as a result of the passage of time or the. Just the colors, the use of colors. The use of Peter Herod has a beautiful grace. Oh, from being that community. Yeah, part of that yeah, community. yeah. Uh, I, I'm, we'll be right back. Okay. Uh, um, this is the Arts in Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Donna Blanchard, and I'm talking to Ed Fru Uke, and we'll be right back. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. This is the Arts in Hawaii on ThinkTech. And I'm talking with Ed Fro Ike. How was that? That was good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, here's what I'd like to do. And, um, uh, go back for just a moment, we talked about the zoo fence. When you were telling me about that earlier, I thought it was a place, zoo fence. <laughs> and it took me a while to realize, that's that fence at the zoo where you go on a beautiful day and you see these amazing works of art yes, there. Yeah. That I, Some of these artists, with their work there, they're very accomplished yes, yeah. artists that you expect I, you know, I always feel like there should be a reverence for the paintings and they should be in hermetically sealed, you know, room somewhere where you, you know, yeah. galleries with the perfect lighting. You just have them hanging on the fence at the zoo. Yeah, at the zoo for, I was there for 38 years. Oh, I'm wow. selling my work there, you know, all amid the dust from the elephant cages, the stench from the monkeys, oh. <laughs> you know? um, but I mean... Now you're painting quite a picture. <laughs> but I met so many interesting people and experiences. I met a lot of people, been a lot of places because by meeting people there, it's a great place. It's a springboard for the art, the artists over here. Uh, it was started by Sunao Hironaka and some other artists. Um, Oh, way back in the 60s, maybe, 50s, maybe. And um, it's been going on ever since. The si uh, we've had problems with the city trying to close us down or, or uh, uh, other people have tried to close the fence down because, yeah. um, but it's still going. Because there's no permit for something like that? Is that what yeah, they have a permit, but then the, uh, I'm not too clear on this. Something about the trust of the Campbell estate or somebody says that um, no, no organization should be profiting from land that you're using from the, that's part of the um. Campbell, uh, the, I think it's Campbell, the Kapilani Park. Mm. 
the whole area of the zoo, everything is on, yeah. But I think we're all benefiting, just benefiting from having that. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's... Along a sidewalk. Yeah, it's just a, it's way at the edge of Waikiki, and so we've had to battle puka shell lays back when the day those were coming out. T-shirt vendors would set up next to us. Wow. At one time, it was like 50 artists there, and then um, now it's not that many because the economy has not been that great. But be before in the 60s, 70s, a lot of artists. That makes me want to go there this weekend. I think I will. Yeah, and Let's check it out. But here's what I'd like to do. If we could start showing um, some of your work on the monitor, you can see right over here at the boat. Okay. Um, how old were you when you painted that? Oh, um, not, this was not that long ago, I think. Oh, maybe 20 years, maybe. Okay. 20 years. 20 years ago. Four in my 40s. So, uh, and uh, the, the boat, where was that? This is Heia. Oh. Uh, Heia Keo, the wider glass bottom boat. Um, the pier would run on the right side. It, and it looks so, to me, it looks almost forlorn. Forlorn, yeah. What yeah. do you feel when you, do you remember what was going on in your life when you painted it? Uh, no, I, yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> Back. Um, I just like the uh, subtle gray colors. Um, and that's what I wanted to paint, just something, and just a pop of color, just a pop of color. Oh, yeah, and you mm -hmm. did it. You did exactly that very well. Um, and is this uh, hanging in someone's home now? I, I think so, yeah. I yeah. hope so. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it was yeah. in a gallery. It's not in the gallery, yeah, yeah. so, okay. Uh, and then the next one that we have. That one, I did it on the, which one, the one on the right? It, yes. The one on the right. Um, that is a forest on the mainland. It looks very, yeah. now that is yeah. one that I have a childhood reaction to. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. And I just exaggerated the lavender colors and um, I, I just like the color lavender purples and the Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Now see the, the light, you, you see the light in coming from the back of, uh -huh. the, of the painting. That's one of the times in your paintings that speaks to me so clearly of this man is seeing something I'm not when he looks at a landscape. You're like, I don't know, the light is the light, which I think of as absence of color, is, I, I don't even know how to say what I'm trying to say. It's like, to me, it's a void. It's an absence of something there. But to you, it is a thing. It is something that you construct. Yeah, I was thinking of a path going home and, um, you know, walking um, a mindful path in mindfulness as you walk. Yeah, and it does, it is a very yeah. peaceful scene. Yeah. There's something about a pathway I have an obsession with. Yeah, yeah a lot of people like paths, that. Yeah. Nature-lined paths. Um, and then, oh, do you remember how long ago this was? This was, must have been maybe 2001 or about 2001, 2002, I think. Okay. And the next one that we have is the core. The koi. I go all over and I take pictures of the koi, of koi ponds, and um, this was a large piece, and um, I love red. My mom's favorite color was red, red orange, and I never connected that until when I've been painting for a while. I had been painting for a while, and um, I was wondering why I love this color so much. Why I love the red orange. Uh, yeah, and then I realized, oh yeah, this red. That's you know, she. She loved it. So I guess that's the connection. So there's a little bit of her in a lot yeah, of her yeah, paintings. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is, you know, I think you're giving those. Ko you're being very grateful. Those koi should be grateful to you. Looking at this, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's beautiful. You know, sometimes in koi ponds, especially when they have those feeders where you put the money in and you feed them and they're just ravenous oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. 
boom, it raised yes. my blood pressure just watching them. But this is so peaceful. And oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the next one that we have, this, uh, this the, Big Island? No, th that's uh, Kahalu, Kahalu, oh. that area in Kahalu, where I live um, along the Ka Kahikili Highway. Um, I, I move things around. I make I put a path in there. It wasn't there, but I do, do things like that. They call artist license. Ah, okay. And yeah, it's, it's to compose it better than yeah. So this is what I see all the time. This the ridge, this couple of ridges like that al along Kahikili Highway. And this lo actually looks like something that could be scenery in Japan. Really? Is, yeah. uh, it looks, uh, do you think that there is an influence in your work? I think... Are you born and raised here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know, maybe some subconscious influence. The only thing I know is I'm Japanese ancestry, that's what, that's the influence. But um, uh, I think more I love the Hawaiian culture a lot. I love cultures. Um, and that, I think, because I studied, I painted on the Koalaos a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's spiritual when I'm out there painting, painting the mountains. It's, um, a lot of people have painted the mountains, but they say they're not happy with it. Sometimes when I go to Ho'omalohia and I paint, um, the, I'm not happy. I, I cannot understand why because I don't know. I don't know if I'm too close to the Ko'olau. I don't know if I um, have respected it. Yeah, you know, um, like I take something, taking images all the time. I need to give back to the Ko'olau as well. You know, um, so uh, a couple of times I would take fruit or something and put on the base of the mountain or something, you know, and that I think the I think the Hawaiians are very um, connected to their aina, the aina, the land, and I think that's part of what I really feel strongly about about the land, you know. Can, can we go to the next one? I think this is the Ko'olau. Yeah, and yeah. that's the, well the other one is Ko'olau too, but this is another, this is near the Pali. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that looks reverent to me. They both do. Yeah, you know, sometimes I look at my paintings and I think, how did I ever paint it myself? I'm thinking, really? Yeah, I'm thinking, man, I don't think I would try to paint it again. <laughs> it's so much. I look at it and say, man, that's a lot of work. Now, how long ago did you do this one? I think this is an older piece. This was um, 20 years ago, maybe. Do you feel like your work is more or less ambitious? How has your work changed over, you know, quite a career? Yeah. Um, people say they see a difference. I think I can see a difference in my work year to year. Um, I think, I think I, I, I really like to um, get into the meditation, spiritual, um, energy part of life, and so I think that has influenced my work a lot. Oh, that's increased yeah. for you, become yeah. more centered on yeah. it. Yeah. This piece looks very ambitious. Uh, the no, cola. Uh, yeah, yeah, cola. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then we'll go to the, we have to go to the next one. This is the last one that we have, and this one is very close to the one that I have. Very similar. Right, the yeah. seascapes. Yeah, I love the seascapes. Oh, and the light in the waves. And that's one of the, you know, when I moved here and I lived in Kailua, very close to the water, and I would go there very often in the morning and just look at the water and the number of colors in the water that you see in. I mm -hmm. lived near the Great Lakes on the mainland, and the Great oh. Lakes are beautiful and they are very dynamic and, and vibrant. But uh, I just had not seen the number of colors in the water there mm. that you do here. And I'm sure it has a lot to do with the, the movement. The movement, yeah. It's now tied in the Great Lakes. Yeah, well, whatever 
you know, is around the water. I tell people to throw it out. So in the water, I add a lot of colors, a lot of warms, in it, as well as the blue color that you would think the ocean is. But also, I add a lot of earth colors into the water. In this one, is there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. In, in, in the back, there's a lot of earth colors. Oh, in the clouds. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. In the clouds, in the, even in the water. Interesting. I'm. Uh, have, you, have you done any um, paintings with people in them? I I do, but not close up. Oh, yeah. I think portraits are too hard. <laughs> Very difficult to capture the, you need to capture, like you gotta capture the essence of the land. You capture the essence of the person. Like yeah. I was telling you earlier about portraits, good portraits and, you know, um, you need to capture that energy, the life. Yeah. Okay, we gotta take a break. Come right back and talk some more about that. I'm Donna Blanchard. This is the Arts in Hawaii on uh, the Think Tech series, and I'm talking with Ezra Ek. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Maria Kashem with our Think Tech news. The city of Gumi, South Korea, has debuted a wirelessly charged electric bus, becoming yet another city to embrace induction charging. The city and county of Honolulu doesn't have electric buses, and it doesn't have induction charging either. The Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology developed the online electric vehicle platform and use on some trams in Seoul. Now the route between the Gumi Station and the Indong District has two induction-powered buses. It's the same technology used to charge phones and toothbrushes wirelessly, but on a larger scale. It relies on magnetic charge plates under the road and in the bus. When the bus passes over the plate, the two magnets are tuned and current flows to the onboard battery. The buses use batteries about a third of the size of batteries in an electric car. With a 7-inch gap between the road and the bus, there's 85% charging efficiency at 100 kilowatts from the road to the bus. The charging plates generally take up only between 5 and 15% of the total route and remain switched off until an induction-capable bus approaches. Inductive charging on buses makes perfect sense since they travel the same routes every day. Installing charging plates under the routes is easier than electrifying the whole transit network. Induction charging is already powering buses in Utah and Germany. Buses in Torino, Italy have used induction charging since 2003, and routes in Utrecht, the Netherlands, introduced induction back in 2010. I'm Maria Kashem. Now back to our program. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard, and we're back. The show's live. This is the Arts in Hawaii on the Think Tech series, and I'm talking with Ed Furo Ike. Furo Ike. So white. Okay. Uh, now, during one of our breaks, um, Jay Fidel uh, uh, and Ed uh, chatted, and, and Jay said it makes him want, the, the conversation makes him want to start painting and Ed you said if you want to you should anything yeah. that you love so can you go through that again why well like I reference Oprah again um, she said you love something then you will be and if you enjoy and you love something you'll be successful at it plus that the benefit of that is that the other benefit is that you are enjoying your life you know um, so yeah, and you, you'll be success, successful at it. Oprah's getting a lot of play on this show. Yes, she sure has. I hope she watches this. <laughs> but do you paint to be successful? Do uh, yeah, initially I wanted to sell a lot of paintings and you know, be an artist, like my teacher, Tagami, live like an artist. Um, uh, yeah, but, no, but looking back now, is like, I've enjoyed it, and that's now that I'm older. I look back, I think I'm so glad because I've really enjoyed my life to now. You know, no matter ups and downs, there's there's heart, you know, uh, headache and stuff in on doing this, but it's enjoyable. Mm -hmm. It's enjoyable. So you know, you, you get frustrated. I get frustrated, but the good stuff outweighs the bad. Yeah. yeah. So I'm really happy for my journey. You know. But if you had to do something else for a living, you'd, I, I'm guessing you would still paint, would you? 
If I had to do something else? If you had to do something else, would you come home at night and still want to paint? Um, yeah, if, if, yeah, yeah. I'm surprised that you had to think about that. <laughs> I just thought you were someone who, I, ha I must paint, I live oh, to paint. Well, I didn't realize that this was a, you know, a, just a career decision, decision rather than a, I must do it. Yeah, yeah because I, at that time, then I wanted to quit my job, and I wanted to do this for a living. So, um, yeah, and then I was doing it. I was working, and then I would come home and paint. So I was doing it. When if you're younger, you have the energy. Um, but you know, I'm I'm thinking with my older mind now. So I'm thinking, wow, there was a lot of work going to work, and paint, oh, painting in the morning, oh, you know, see. getting up. Yeah. Rushing, rushing, going paint, come back, take a shower, get ready, go to work, rush home, then go out and paint, and you know, um, but wow. uh, yeah, yeah, but it's yeah, it, it would, I, I would, <laughs> I would. <laughs> Just surprised me with the pause there. Uh, so, how long ago was it? Well, how many years of your career has you have you spent as an artist without uh, having to have a day job? How many years did I yeah, spend? Have you supported yourself as an artist? Uh, I started like, since 1980. Pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> 1980. Uh, and have you been teaching ever since then? You know, teaching is, a not, is something, an added benefit for me that I found, I just found out within the last 20 years. Never, I didn't want to teach because people would say, you don't teach because don't tell all your secrets. So I said, you know, I cannot do that. When I talk to people or teach people, I cannot hold back things. And so that's, I think, a big problem with me. My, some people tell me that's my problem is that I just say things. And um, so I, I cannot teach some people and hold back things. So I just need to teach the like, Tagami. He just taught me, and he is a has been a good um, phil is a good philosopher too. His his philosophy of life. Um, yeah. So I said I want to enjoy teaching, and I don't want to feel if I'm going to have to teach somebody and I've got to hold back. I'm not going to enjoy myself. You know. So and I said and like the meditation and all this. They said. Um, who's, I've read books of Emmett Fox and all these people. They say there's room for everybody. There's, everybody can be have. There's enough for everybody. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, and have you have any of your students? You've been teaching for 35 years. So have yeah. any of your students? Do you feel that they have taken some of your secrets and run with them? Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel some have, and and they're finding some success too. You know. But um, I do enjoy teaching. That's the other thing. Like now, as I get older, I'm thinking, oh, you know, I will always want to teach because it keeps my mind active, and it also I also learn from these people as I'm teaching. I'm learning from them, and, and it's a tremendous um, benefit to them. Because you said you paint during your classes, yeah, you paint yeah, also. Yeah. So I'm helping them with their work, self, uh, solve their problems, and so when they do that, then I'm. When I'm painting and I come upon the similar problem or uh, situation, then I use that of what I was teaching them. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning a lot from them. So they joke with me and said, well, then I should be painting them <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah. They would say that. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some of them are wrong. Uh, I, you know, I um, have worked as an actor for most of my life, and as I but when I got into theater management, I found that it was like a busman's holiday for me to be on stage. So I haven't done much work on the stage in a long time. And that's when I started painting. Oh. Just acrylics and brushes and uh, no training whatsoever. And I've purposely kept it that way because I feel like it, I don't want any rules surrounding it. This is an artistic expression that I feel like I need to have, but I don't want if once I put borders on it, it's not going to feel mm -hmm. as free. But talking to you makes me 
feel like I might be more free if I had some borders. Yeah, because when, <laughs> when I teach too, I don't say you need to, you got to stay this way. I just guide them, their style, their going, their painting, and I'm just guiding them. It's only when they get really frustrated. So I, then I said, well, then if you, then do it this way. But um, you, I'm usually, I'm guiding their style. So, you know, their style is not exactly like mine. You know, but like, you know, you, you cannot copy the teacher anyway. You, you cannot copy any other artist really. Especially a palette knife work, I feel. Because you know, there's a different energy. You have a different energy, I have a different energy. And that makes a big difference in the work. Where do you see yourself going with your art? Um, What's next? Uh, I just want to be happy. <laughs> happy painting. I see myself um, maybe after I'm gone, then my paintings will sell for millions of dollars. Like <laughs> I'm holding on to mine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. Because I had a hard thing done, a stent put in, lying in the hospital. Then I was thinking, oh my God, all these people are going to get so rich <laughs> if I go. So I, no, I want to spend my own money too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You should just keep painting and selling yeah, them yeah, now. And, yeah. uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming in Thank and you. bringing props and displays with you. I really enjoyed our conversation. I feel Thank you. I did too. Uh, like I learned an awful lot. Um, and we have to go. I haven't been paying attention here, so let me get to this. Um, well, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the managing director of Kumu Kukui Theater. I've been talking with Ed Fru Ike, and uh, this is the Think Tech series. Um, I'll be back next week with Tim Bostock of Bostock Productions and um, uh, he's also been the acting artistic director of the Kahi Kahilu Theater in on the Big Island. Oh. And they were closed for a while, and they most just recently reopened. That'll be interesting. Um, uh, thank you very much to uh, Jay Fidel, who puts all of this together. Thank you very much, and he prompts me to ask interesting questions. Uh, thank you to you for being here. Check out our previous broadcasts on YouTube. Just go to thinktechhawaii.com, and please like us on Facebook. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions, and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo.